My name's Jim Jensen, and thank you for joining me. Thank you, David Paul, for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. What I'm going to talk about is phonemic awareness, and I'm going to make the claim that phonemic awareness is the most important thing you can teach a young foreign language learner. And I'm going to base that claim on two facts. One is that phonemic awareness is simply that fundamental. For natives, it is the most important predictor of the ability to read. For non-native speakers, it is equally important for reading, but also important for listening and speaking. It is fundamental in the strongest sense of that word. The second point I'm going to make is that it gets more difficult with time. It's the only thing that gets more difficult with time. You can teach vocabulary later. You can teach grammar later. The ability to hear the sounds gets more difficult. It is absolutely fundamental, but it gets more difficult with time. Those are my two points. And I will elaborate. But first, I think I should define some terms. A phoneme. A phoneme is the smallest unit of sound in a language. Er, un, run. Three phonemes. Shock. Three phonemes. Five letters three phonemes. Phonemic awareness is not phonics. It's, it has nothing to do with the letters. In a second language setting, it can be taught along with the letters, but phonemic awareness is the sounds only. The definition of phonemic awareness a simple definition that I will use is the ability to distinguish the sounds of a language and to manipulate the sounds. So distinguish the sounds means to be able to tell the difference between the different sounds. Spanish speakers, for example, cannot distinguish E and I of English. If you say bid, they hear bead. Japanese people cannot distinguish R and L. So phonemic awareness is the ability to distinguish a language's sounds and to manipulate them, which means to understand that words are made of sounds and to change them or recognize them, delete them. For example, you might ask students, which word starts with a different sound. Bed, bad, red. Students should be able to recognize that red starts with a different sound. I will say something more about manipulating the sounds later. But first, I want to read something. This is from Dr. Goswami the director of the Center for Neuroscience in Education at Cambridge. 
The way in which the brain represents the sound structure of spoken language, phonology, is critical for the future development of literacy. The brain develops phonological representations in response to spoken language exposure and learning to speak. And the quality of these phonological representations determines literacy acquisition. We hear sounds, spoken language. We create representations of those sounds in our brains. The quality of those sounds determines, doesn't influence, doesn't play a role in, isn't important to, she said, the quality of those sound representations in our brains phonological representations determines the ability to read. That is how fundamental phonemic awareness is. Now she's talking about phonology, the entirety of the phonology. When you talk about acquiring the sounds, the phonemes, turn to Patricia Kuhl and how she explains the acquisition of the sounds. She calls it a sound map. As soon as we're born, we are hearing the sounds of our native language or languages. And we start to categorize those sounds. It's categorical perception. We do that with vision, we do that with other aspects of our cognition, and we do it with the sounds. We build a category around the sound, an abstraction. Generalize, or form an abstraction of the sound, and around that sound, anything that sounds like that sound is heard as that sound. And we create a category for each sound in our language. Later, when someone speaks to us, we hear the sounds according to our sound map, according to our native language. So that if I have the sound map of a Spanish speaker and someone says, bid, bid, it changes and I hear it as bead. We filter language through our native sound map. And this occurs around our first birthday. Before we learn to speak our native language or languages, we have formed a sound map based on our native language. Some people are surprised by this. We lose the ability to hear non-native sounds around our first birthday, and people are surprised. Some people don't believe it. This research goes back decades, beginning with Peter Imus in 1971. What he did was he put a transmitter in babies' sucking devices, the pacifier, and he had a broadcast, ba, ba, ba. These are one-month-old babies, and he got comfortable, and they started sucking, mm, ba, ba, and he changed the sound, pa, pa, and the babies, mm, they changed their sucking rates, indicating they could hear the change in the phonemes. Whoa, everybody was very excited about this. One-month-old babies. So they checked, replicated different sounds, vowels, fricatives, different languages. Whoa! 
Spanish babies can distinguish E from E. Japanese babies can distinguish R and L. Adults can't. By 1980, they called infants universal listeners. They said babies can hear the sounds of all natural languages, which is fairly obvious. It's not surprising. If you take a Chinese baby, put him or her in Africa, that baby will speak with the clicks of the African language. If you take an American baby and put him into a Chinese environment, he will speak with the tones. Our brains are wired to learn whatever language we are exposed to. But that closes. That universal listening phase closes before we learn to speak, uh, before we start to speak. This was demonstrated in 1984 by Janet Worker. I suggest you watch the video. It's fascinating for a number of reasons. It's 1984 and they have a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder which some young viewers may never have seen. <laughs> it's been replicated many times. What she did, she's Canadian, she recorded the sounds of a Canadian English, Canadian Indian language, Canadian Indian language that has two sounds native English speakers cannot distinguish. For there sounds like L and R to Japanese or E and I to Spanish. There are two sounds that English speakers cannot distinguish. She recorded them, brought babies to her lab. Six to eight month old, eight to ten month old, and ten to twelve month old. Three age groups. Put the babies on their mother's lap, had darkness in front of them with a big toy, moving toy here and a big moving toy here. And they turn on the light and it was sound one. They turn on the light, sound two. Turn on the light sound one. They trained these babies for about five minutes. And then they changed the order. Sound first. Six-month-old babies, seven-month-old babies could look in the direction of the sound before the light came on. In anticipation of the light. They hear the sound, they would look in the right direction. One-year-olds could not do it. They had lost the ability to distinguish those sounds. This has also been replicated many, many times. And it's a problem for second language learners. These phonological representations that we have are fundamental to reading for native speakers but listening and speaking for non-native speakers. And native speakers have problems with that. That's who Dr. Goswami is talking about. She's not talking about non-native speakers. She's talking about the quality of the representation in native speakers because there are children, native-speaking English children, who have difficulty readings. And there's a wide spectrum of problems. Children with autism have severe problems with phonemic awareness. Other children have slight problems. They need to be trained. Every second language student has those problems simply because their phonology is different than English phonology. So what should we do? I would suggest we train our students the same way. Native children who have phonological problems are trained to hear the sounds. We lose the ability to hear non-native sounds 
in normal situations. If the sounds are made audible, if the sounds are made salient, students can learn them. The way they treat native people, native students with phonological awareness problems is high variability phonemic training. Phonemic training simply means phone, uh, minimal pairs with stressed, exaggerated, contrasting sounds. You take the two sounds that are con that are different and you stress them. Red lead. You make the sounds so the students can hear them. If students can hear the sounds, they can learn them. They can create new sound maps or expand the borders of their existing sound maps, depending on the nature of the native phonology. That is the first half of what I described as the definition of phonemic awareness is the ability to distinguish the sounds. And they can learn to hear the difference, but it becomes more difficult with age. And this is not a biological event like was once believed at puberty. It's simply a habit. It's Hebbian learning. The longer you wait, the more often the students mishear and misspeak. And the more often you mishear, the harder it is to stop mishearing. It's a habit. They get in the habit of hearing and speaking, and it becomes more difficult to correct it. It should be taught as young as possible. High variability phonemic training. The high variability, by the way, means numerous voices, a variety of voices. It's been shown that using numerous voices is more effective than one voice. And this is not something you should spend 30 minutes on in your class. Short exposures, four or five minutes, as often as possible, as homework. Before, before dinner, when the rice is cooking, on the train, while waiting for the dentist, expose these young learners to contrasting sounds so that they can hear them. Some are fairly easy to learn, some are more difficult to learn. Again, it depends on the two phonologies, the, the way the native phonology contrasts with English phonology. Short exposures, five minutes, high availability phonemic training, to acquire the ability to distinguish the sounds. As for manipulating the sounds, there is a lot of material online about that. Too much material for me to go into now. I just hope to make people aware of the importance of teaching phonemic awareness and starting young. There's a lot of material online because it's so important to native speaking children. You can go there. The kind of activities they have are clapping, marching, recognizing, depending on the age, recognizing sentences or words, I like ice cream, I like pounding pencils, whatever, and then breaking words into syllables, names, Takahiro, and then breaking the syllables into phonemes, run, sh, ok. just making the students aware. There's many ways to do this. And of course, there is a, for older students, there's a sound change game where you give them a word, bed, 
and you ask them to change e to a. Bad. Correct. Ping pong. Those kinds of activities, and there are a lot of them, you can find them online. The point I wanted to make is that this is a fundamental skill and that it's best to start young. And that it's not very difficult, it's listening. I want to make two other points before I finish. And one has to do with a study and the name of the, the title of the study speaks for itself. Kovacs and Mailer. What they did, what they did was they had a screen and a ball and two groups of seven-month-old children. They took the ball and they brought it behind the screen, made a sound, beep, and then brought it over here. Beep, 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 and then they changed the side. Beep, change the side, beep. The bilingual children were quicker to recognize the change. There a lot is said about the bilingual advantage, and they talk about enhanced executive function and cognitive flexibility. Well, this bilingual advantage was showing up with seven-year-old, seven-month-old children. They were simply learning the sounds, and that realization that there were two systems or something, that there's two possibilities, that there's not just one way. Whatever it is, it was working very young when they were acquiring phonemic awareness. The other point I want to make has to go back to when I was in graduate school and the, the, the idea at that time was that Super segmentals are more important than segmentals. Segmentals being the phonemes, the smallest segments of the language, and the super segmentals being above them. Blending, accent, intonation, the things that are above or above the segments. And they came to this idea by sitting a native down with a non native and having an interview. And then after the interview, they ask the non-native what was difficult. And they'd say, oh, word blending, and it was fast, and I couldn't understand the accent. And they decided that those super segmentals were more important than the segmentals. And that is true. If the, non, if the native does not accommodate the non-native, so if you're watching a movie or something like that, it's going to be very difficult because it's made for natives. But in a conversation, most natives will accommodate the non-natives, so those problems are somewhat resolved. Also, if two non-native English speakers use English, those supersegmental problems disappear because they will almost naturally accommodate each other, but they also speak slower and clearer and make an attempt to be more careful. 20 years ago, over 20 years ago now, Jennifer Jenkins pointed out that when two non-native speakers use English, the biggest source of communication breakdown is at the phonemic level with the sounds, mispronouncing sounds, m making words difficult to understand. If you are training a student to go to some sp English-speaking country, focus on that language, focus on this, the super segmentals, teach them fair dinkum, mate, 
but if you are teaching students to be citizens of the world who can use English with natives and non-natives, focus on the sounds, the phonemes. They are fundamental. They have to be learned young. And it's simply exposing them to sounds that they can hear. If students can hear the sound, they can learn them. That's all for me. I hope this was interesting. And I want to thank David Paul one more time for giving me the chance to speak to you. And thank you for making it to the end with me. Thank you.